Good morning, philosophers. You're all terrifically smart kids, and I'm sure that growing up, many of you heard parents and teachers comment on how precocious you were for your age. But there's precociousness, and then there's the kind of childhood that John Stuart Mill, the protagonist of today's lecture, had. John Stuart Mill was born in 1806, the eldest son of James Mill, a Scottish philosopher, political economist, and colonial administrator in the British East India Company. James Mill was also a devoted follower of Jeremy Bentham, the father of modern utilitarianism. How devoted, you ask? So devoted that he quite literally pledged his firstborn child to the cause. James Mill's explicit aim in raising his son, John Stuart, was to create a genius intellect who would carry the torch of utilitarianism after Bentham and James Mill had died. Little John Stuart was given an incredibly rigorous upbringing. He was homeschooled by his father and by Jeremy Bentham and deliberately shielded from associating with children his own age. At the tender age of three, they began teaching him ancient Greek. By the time he turned eight, John Stuart had read Aesop's fables, all of Plato's dialogues, and the whole histories of Herodotus, the Greek historian we encountered in our last lecture. He'd also read a great deal of history in English and had been taught arithmetic, physics, and astronomy. At age eight, he was also officially appointed schoolmaster to the younger children in his family. I bet they must have loved that. Simultaneously, he immersed himself in the study of Latin, geometry, and algebra. By the age of 10, he'd read all commonly taught Latin and Greek authors and had also started to compose his own original poetry in English, while at the same time studying scholastic logic and the political economy of Adam Smith and David Ricardo. And by the age of 20, Mill had suffered a mental breakdown and was pondering suicide. He writes in his autobiography that he was saved by reading the poetry of Wordsworth with its celebration of aesthetic beauty as a means of inducing compassion for others. Now, this episode marked a decisive break in Mill's intellectual development. Whereas before he had been raised as an orthodox utilitarian in the mold of Jeremy Bentham and his father James, he now struck out by himself, developing his own independent moral philosophy. Mill's canonical statement of his own version of utilitarianism, his book of the same title, was published in 1863. For the remainder of his life, Mill remained a notable free thinker, far ahead of his time on many issues. He supported the abolition of slavery in the United States, calling it, quote, the absolute extreme case of the law of force, revolting to the feeling of all who look at it from an impartial position. Even more notable for his time, Mill was a proto-feminist. As a member of parliament for the Liberal Party, Mill was only the second MP to call for women's suffrage in 1866. He championed the cause of women's rights in his book On the Subjection of Women, published in 1869, and attributed many of his philosophical ideas in On Liberty to his longtime friend and later wife, Harriet Taylor. She's the woman to whom On Liberty is dedicated. The book itself was published in 1859, shortly after Harriet Taylor's death. But at the same time, even a notable free thinker like Mill was not free of the corrupting influence of the time he lived in. He followed his father James into the employ of the British East, Com East India Company, for which he worked from 1823 to 1858. In that capacity, Mill acted as a kind of apologist for Britain's exploitation of its colonial empire and argued in defense of what he termed benevolent despotism with regard to the colonies. He wrote in his dissertations and discussions, political, philosophical, and historical, I quote, to suppose that the same international customs and the same rules of international morality can obtain between one civilized nation and another and between civilized nations and barbarians is a grave error. 
to characterize any conduct whatever towards a barbarous people as a violation of the law of nations only shows that he who so speaks has never considered the subject. As we will see, traces of this same thinking can be found in the pages of On Liberty as well. But despite these ugly flaws, which must not go unmentioned, Mill's short book remains one of the absolute classics of political thought, perhaps the greatest work of political philosophy of the 19th century. To say that On Liberty has been influential since its publication in 1859 is a massive understatement. It is commonly regarded as the Bible of classical liberalism, and its ideas have been cited in countless judicial and political decisions over the years, such as in Oliver Wendell Holmes's Free Speech Jurisprudence, or in the Act of Parliament decriminalizing homosexuality in the UK in 1967. So it still very much repays close study. The subject matter of On Liberty is the nature and limits of the power that can be legitimately exercised by society over the individual. Mill begins his book by contrasting what he calls old and new threats to liberty. The old threat to liberty is found in traditional monarchic or aristocratic societies where there's rule by one or rule by an oligarchic few over the many. The traditional worry about liberty in such contexts is this. When rulers are politically unaccountable to the people, they will rule in their own interests and will restrict the liberties of their subjects in ways that benefit themselves rather than the ruled. Traditional remedies to this old threat to liberty include a charter of basic liberties, such as the British Magna Carta or the American Bill of Rights, as well as various constitutional safeguards. However, by the time Mill is writing On Liberty in the 1850s, these traditional worries about liberty had begun to subside somewhat. Britain by then was a parliamentary monarchy, seriously flawed, of course, in many ways. Mill himself would have been the first to admit that but nonetheless a government by representatives of the people, accountable in elections to at least part of the wider populace. So the threat to liberty that so preoccupied the ancients may be thought to have dissipated with the advent of representative democracy. When government is by the people and representatives serve at the pleasure of the people and can be voted out of office, must we still be as concerned with limiting the powers of the government? Mill thinks we do. Democracies, he thinks, contain their own threats to liberty. There can be tyranny not just of the one or of the few, but of the majority. As he writes, the people who exercise the power are not always the same people with those over whom it is exercised. And the self-government spoken of is not the government of each by himself, but of each by all the rest. The will of the people, moreover, practically means the will of the most numerous and the most active part of the people. The majority, or those who succeed in making themselves accepted as the majority, the people consequently may desire to oppress a part of their number and precautions are as much needed against this as against any other abuse of power. The limitation, therefore, of the power of government over individuals loses none of its importance when the holders of power are regularly accountable to the community, that is, to the strongest party therein." End quote. What is more, there is a second worry to which his predecessors have been insufficiently attentive, Mill thinks. Because threats to liberty arise not just from legal sanctions, from the actions of a society's magistrates, but from social sanctions as well. As he writes in section one of On Liberty, quote, when society is itself the tyrant, society collectively over the separate individuals who compose it, its means of tyrannizing are not restricted to the acts which it may do by the hands of its political functionaries. Society can and does execute its own mandates 
and if it issues wrong mandates instead of right, or any mandates at all in things with which it ought not to meddle, it practices a social tyranny more formidable than many kinds of political oppression, since, though not usually upheld by such extreme pen penalties, it leaves fewer means of escape, penetrating much more deeply into the details of life and enslaving the soul itself. Protection, therefore, against the tyranny of the magistrate is not enough. There needs protection also against the tyranny of the prevailing opinion and feeling, against the tendency of society to impose, by other means than civil penalties, its own ideas and practices as rules of conduct on those who dissent from them, to fetter the development and, if possible, prevent the formation of any individuality not in harmony with its ways, and compels all characters to fashion themselves upon the model of its own. There is a limit to the legitimate interference of collective opinion with individual independence. And to find that limit and maintain it against encroachment is as indispensable to a good condition of human affairs as protection against political despotism. End quote. So the aim of Mill's essay, then, is to find that limit on the legitimate interference of the collective with the individual. That is a question which is as relevant and as urgent in our time as it was during the Victorian era when Mill was writing his essay. What is needed, Mill thinks, is a statement of the principled basis on which it is permissible for society or individuals, either through legal means or in formal social sanctions, to restrict the freedom of individuals. For John Stuart Mill, this is his famous harm principle, found in section one of On Liberty. It reads as follows. The sole end for which mankind are warranted, individually or collectively, in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their number is self-protection. That the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant. He cannot rightfully be compelled to do or forbear because it will be better for him to do so, because it will make him happier, because in the opinions of others, to do so would be wise or even right. Now, this is the key passage of Mill's entire book. So let's pause for a moment and examine it more closely. I put it to you that in this passage, Mill distinguishes three potential grounds for restricting the freedom of individuals, but only one of which he thinks is actually legitimate. I'd like you to pause your video and take a few moments to work out for yourself what the three potential grounds for restricting people's liberty mentioned in this passage are. And which is the only ground that Mill himself considers legitimate? I'll wait for you. All right, welcome back. So I said that in the famous passage stating his harm principle, Mill distinguishes three potential grounds for restricting a person's liberty of thought or action, but ends up endorsing only one of them. So let's begin there. According to Mill's so-called harm principle, the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. In other words, A's restriction of B's liberty is an application of the harm principle, and therefore potentially permissible, according to Mill, if and only if it is done to prevent harm to someone other than B. By contrast, let us say that A's restriction of B's liberty is paternalistic, if and only if it is done for B's own benefit. Paternalism, in general, is restricting someone's liberty for the sake of their own good. Mill is a committed anti-paternalist, 
He rejects paternalism as a permissible ground for restricting someone's liberty. As he writes, his own good is not a sufficient warrant for restricting someone's liberty. He cannot rightfully be compelled to do or forbear because it will be better for him to do so or because it will make him happier. Finally, to introduce a third bit of terminology, let us say that A's restriction of B's liberty is moralistic if and only if it is done to ensure that B acts morally or does not act immorally. Now, this is different from paternalistic interference if we think that not all immoral behavior is ipso facto bad for you. Mill likewise rejects moralism as an appropriate ground for restricting someone's liberty. Just as we should not re reject someone's freedom for the sake of her physical well-being, he thinks, we shouldn't restrict her freedom for the sake of her moral good either. As he puts it, we cannot rightfully compel someone to do or forbear from an action just because to do so would be wise or even right. Now, later in On Liberty, Mill considers and rejects a fourth possible ground for restricting a person's freedom, namely that his action gives offense to others. For Mill, it is very important to draw a sharp distinction between genuine harm on the one hand and mere offense on the other. Mill does not think that merely giving offense, in words or in deed, constitutes harm. Therefore, under his harm principle, an opinion or action could not be legitimately restricted because it violated the conventions or morals of a given society, so long as it doesn't harm anyone else. So, Mill's basic approach to liberty and restrictions on liberty is what we might call a categorical approach. In order to decide whether an individual's liberty ought to be protected, we must determine to which category the potential restriction of liberty belongs. Are we seeking to restrict a person's freedom for moralistic reasons, i.e. to prevent them from behaving in a way that is morally wrong? Are we restricting their freedom for paternalistic reasons, to prevent them from harming themselves? Are we restricting their freedom because their conduct gives offense to others? Or are we restricting their freedom to prevent others from harm? Now, at least in competent adults, the only restrictions that are potentially permissible belong to this last category, i.e. they involve the prevention of harm to others. Now, it should be noted that for Mill, harms may include not just acts of commission, like hitting someone else over the head, but also acts of omission, such as, for example, failing to pay your debts. Now, when Mill stresses that at least in competent adults, the only legitimate basis for restricting someone's liberty is the avoidance of harm to others, what is the contrast he has in mind? Whose liberty does Mill think can permissibly be restricted for their own good? Well, children, for one, who have not yet attained a state of mental maturity where they are capable of making sound decisions for themselves. For another, persons without, quote, the ordinary amount of understanding, that is, those people who would now be considered seriously cognitively handicapped or mentally ill. Thirdly, and this is one of those passages I alluded to in my introduction that will strike contemporary readers as highly problematic, Mill suggests that entire peoples can be at a stage of moral development where they are not ready for true self-government. Such peoples may be in need of a benign despot, an Akbar or a Charlemagne, as he writes, to lead them to a stage of development where they are capable of responsibly governing their own affairs. Mill viewed civilizations such as China's or India's as having once been progressive, but being now stagnant and barbarous, thus legitimizing British rule as benevolent despotism, provided, quote, the end is the barbarian's improvement. So I guess this is how Mill justified his and his family's involvement with Britain's colonial project in India to himself. But to note that these passages were likely written from an attempt to rationalize his own involvement with Britain's colonial project 
is in no way to excuse them. Now, I stressed a second word above, namely potentially permissible. For Mill, preventing harm to others is a necessary, but not a sufficient condition for restricting someone's liberty. If a person's conduct is harmful to others, this is a potential candidate for regulation. However, whether restricting their liberty is all things considered appropriate depends on a utilitarian calculation of whether the benefits of regulation in fact exceed its costs. It might be that, though we spare others from some harm by preventing the conduct in question, the attempt to regulate the conduct in question would itself do greater harm in the aggregate. In that case, Mill thinks we should refrain from interfering, even under the harm principle. All right, let's move on. So, having set out his central idea, the harm principle, in section one of his essay, Mill then proceeds to defend and explain it by means of a series of case studies. Mill begins his defense of basic liberties with a discussion of freedom of thought and expression. Why? Well, Mill thinks that there is general agreement on the importance of free speech, and that once the grounds for free speech are understood, this agreement can then be exploited to support a more general defense of individual liberties. Mill makes four arguments for freedom of opinion and expression in section two of On Liberty. The first of these is his argument from fallibility. We shouldn't restrict freedom of expression, the argument goes, because a censored opinion might be true. Censors aren't infallible. As Mill writes, if an opinion is compelled to silence, that opinion may, for aught we can certainly know, be true. To deny this is to assume our own infallibility. By suppressing an opinion, Mill thinks, we are robbing the human race, posterity as well as the existing generation, those who dissent from the opinion still more than those who hold it. For if the opinion is right, they are deprived of the opportunity of exchanging error for truth. Now, Mill isn't here making the claim that all opinions have value or even are worth airing. It's rather that there is no individual or institution whom he would trust to make the decision as to which opinions are worthless on his behalf. No censor is infallible. But now you might wonder, isn't infallibility an excessively high standard to apply? Surely governments must, must act all the time on the basis of less than absolute certainty. So why not also when it comes to the censoring of opinions which, given the available evidence, are most likely false? Well, Mill considers this objection, but makes the following retort, I quote, There's the greatest difference between presuming an opinion to be true, because with every opportunity for contesting it, it has not been refuted, and assuming its truth for the purpose of not permitting its refutation. Complete liberty of contradicting and disproving our opinion is the very condition which justifies us in assuming its truth for purposes of action. What Mill is saying here is this. It is only by allowing unpopular opinions to be freely expressed and to potentially falsify received wisdom that we can actually have merited confidence in the received wisdom. Or, as Mill puts it, if the Newtonian philosophy were not permitted to be questioned, mankind could not feel as complete assurance of its truth as we, they do now. The beliefs which we have most warrant for have no safeguard to rest on, but a standing invitation to the whole world to prove them unfounded. Mill's second argument, the argument from partial truth, goes like this. Quote, Though the silenced opinion be an error, it may, and very commonly does, contain a portion of truth. And since the general or prevailing opinion on any subject is rarely or never the whole truth, 
It is only by the collision of adverse opinions that the remainder of the truth has any chance of being supplied. End quote. In other words, even if it is literally false, a censored opinion might contain at least part of the truth and is therefore worth hearing. Third, we have Mill's argument from dogmatism. Even if wholly false, a censored opinion would prevent true opinions from becoming what he calls dead dogma. As Mill writes, Even if the received opinion be not only true, but the whole truth, unless it is suffered to be and actually is vigorously and earnestly contested, it will, by most of those who receive it, be held in the manner of a prejudice, with little comprehension or feeling of its rational grounds. So, unless we allow our own beliefs to be challenged, Mill thinks, we will not learn to properly defend them, and therefore won't fully understand the best case in their support. As he says, he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. His reasons may be good, and no one may have been able to refute them, but if he is equally unable to refute the reasons on the opposite side, if he does not so much as know what they are, he has no ground for preferring either opinion. Finally, there is what might be called Mill's argument from meaning. As a dogma, an unchallenged opinion will lose its very meaning, Mill thinks, as he writes, the meaning of the doctrine itself will be in danger of being lost or enfeebled and deprived of its vital effect on the character and conduct. The dogma becoming a mere formal profession, inefficacious for good, but cumbering the ground and preventing the growth of any real and heartfelt conviction from reason or personal experience. In other words, if you hold a doctrine not as belief that you are prepared to defend against objections, but just as dead dogma, it is likely that this will soon become something to which you merely pay lip service. It will cease to genuinely motivate you. Mill gives the example of Christians mumbling assent to the injunction to love their neighbor as themselves in church on Sunday, but utterly failing to live up to or even take seriously this precept in the way they conduct their daily affairs. Now, Mill's four arguments for free expression can be subdivided into two groups. The first two arguments represent freedom of expression as instrumentally valuable. It is valuable not in itself, but as the most reliable means of producing something else that Mill assumes is valuable, either instrumentally or intrinsically, namely true belief. Some drawbacks of these instrumental arguments uh, are that they are potentially vulnerable to empirical challenge. We may wonder, must freedom of expression always be conducive to the spread of true beliefs? Think of events in recent political history, disinformation campaigns on Facebook, the proliferation of fake news and conspiracy theories like QAnon on the internet, the proliferation of climate change denial and anti-vaccine activism, and so on. More generally, in words often attributed to Mark Twain, a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. By the way, it's a delicious irony that this quote is probably misattributed to Mark Twain and wasn't actually said by him. And supposing we could pull it off, we might wonder, would there be a principled objection to successful, competent censorship which promotes the spread of true beliefs? The arguments from dogmatism and from meaning provide the resources for a more robust defense of freedom of expression. These arguments claim that free expression is needed not just in order to allow us to acquire the truth, but in order to keep true beliefs from becoming dogmatic. Mill is here drawing a distinction between true belief and knowledge, which Mill, like most philosophers at the time, understood as something like justified true belief. As he writes, Assuming that the true opinion abides in the mind 
but abides as a prejudice, a belief independent of and proof against argument, this is not the way in which truth ought to be held by a rational being. This is not knowing the truth. So this reason for valuing freedom of expression, that it gives us access not just to true belief but to knowledge, would persist even on the assumption that all and only false beliefs would be censored. Okay, but here's a little thinking exercise for you. Ask yourself, do you agree with Mill on the supreme importance of having justified true beliefs as opposed to true beliefs that are merely true? Could this perhaps vary depending on the subject matter in question? What if we knew, for example, that allowing the free expression of opinions, more people would have false beliefs, say on the question whether climate change is real or whether vaccines cause autism, because they fall prey to seductive disinformation campaigns, but that those who do have true beliefs have a livelier understanding of why their beliefs are true, because they've been actively challenged to, de to de defend them by people holding false beliefs. Is this always a trade-off worth making? In other words, if there is a trade-off between quality of belief and preponderance of belief, i.e. between more people holding justified true beliefs and more people holding true beliefs, which is more important? Now, despite his full-throated defense of freedom of speech, Mill does believe that even freedom of expression is not limitless. There are some restrictions on free expression that fall directly out of the harm principle itself. As Mill writes in section 3 of On Liberty, even opinions lose their immunity when the circumstances in which they are expressed are such as to constitute their expression a positive instigation to some mischievous act. An opinion that corn dealers are starvers of the poor or that private property is robbery ought to be unmolested when simply circulated through the press but may justifiably incur punishment when delivered orally to an excited mob assembled before the house of a corn dealer or when handed, a, uh, handed about among the same mob in the form of a placard. Now, although Mill's arguments in favor of free expression are relatively straightforward, there are often many subtleties to consider in applying them to concrete actual cases. I want to encourage you to think about one particular such case in precept, namely the problem of Holocaust denial. Holocaust denial, that is, the activity of negating the historical reality of the key events and processes that constitute the Holocaust, is a punishable offense in a number of countries. There are laws against Holocaust denial in Austria, Belgium, the Czech Republic, France, Germany, Israel, Liechtenstein, Lithuania, Luxembourg, Poland, Portugal, Romania, Spain, and Switzerland, though not in the United States, which carry maximum sentences from one year in Belgium to up to 20 years in Austria. On the other hand, legislative provisions criminalizing Holocaust denial are often criticized by civil libertarians as constituting an unjustifiable infringement of free speech. It is incompatible with our right to free speech, these civil libertarians claim, that someone should be subject to prosecution in criminal or civil law based on their having publicly defended a controversial historical claim, however obviously incorrect or offensive such claims may be. How do you think should a million liberal think about the propriety of laws outlawing Holocaust denial? I think it is not a straightforward matter. Take the question, does Holocaust denial constitute mere offense, or could it constitute or precipitate a form of harm? Should we agree with the nursery rhyme that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me? That is to say, words, however offensive, don't count as genuine harm. 
Or could Holocaust denial be construed as a form of psychological violence against certain listeners? It might be argued that in its more openly racist and virulently anti-Semitic forms, Holocaust denial targeted at Jewish audiences and disseminated through anonymous phone calls and letters, graffiti, bulk mail, or leafleting, is a form of verbal assault resembling hate speech. As numerous studies confirm, the effects of hate speech are often traumatic and go far beyond the ephemeral psychological disturbance that we associate with mere offense. Victims of hate speech are often fearful and reduced in their self-worth, and sometimes respond by withdrawing from full participation in society. Another reason for thinking that Holocaust denial may go beyond mere offensive speech and cause actual harm is that even in its pseudo-academic variants, Holocaust denial often approaches a form of collective defamation, not just of the victims of the Holocaust and its survivors, whose testimony and by extension their truthfulness are impugned, but of Jews in general. As a historical thesis, Holocaust denial necessarily leads to questions about how the alleged falsehoods about the existence of the Holocaust came to be so widely believed, questions which Holocaust deniers typically don't leave unanswered. Instead, they supply explanatory theories. The Holocaust is a Jewish myth intended to justify the founding of the State of Israel or to steal billions in reparation from post-war Germany which are themselves heavily anti-Semitic in their implications. It is perhaps quite difficult not to view the damage done by such remarks to the reputation of Jews as a kind of harm. Thirdly, we might wonder, could there be a robust enough connection between Holocaust denial and physical violence to view it as a form of incitement? The defamatory implications of Holocaust denial by making attacks on Jews appear more legitimate, are often viewed as contributing to a rise in violent incidents directed against Jews, to the desecration of Jewish cemeteries, attacks on synagogues and Jewish cultural institutions, and so on. So could Holocaust denial be viewed as a form of incitement akin to Mill's corn cellar example, and therefore covered by his harm principle? So that's the first set of questions I'd like you to discuss. Should we think of Holocaust denial as merely a form of offensive speech and thus protected by a million position on free speech? Or could it correctly be characterized as constituting, or at least, at least precipitating harm, which would make it a legitimate target for criminalization under Mill's harm principle? Second, I want you to ask yourselves, do you agree with Mill that, unlike harm, mere offensiveness can never be a legitimate ground for criminalization? This assumption has of late come under critical scrutiny from many political liberals. What do you think? Third, I want you to ask, how plausible do you think is Mill's argument from dogmatism in the context of Holocaust denial? As we saw, Mill argues that even opini opinions almost universally held to be false can have their instrumental value. They allow us to achieve the clearer perception and livelier impression of truth produced by its collision with error. This is important, Mill claims, because true beliefs, if unchallenged, quickly turn into dogma, and this is not how they ought to be held. Human beings, Mill claims, ought to seek knowledge and not simply true belief. Would this argument provide us with a persuasive rationale against criminalizing Holocaust denial? I think there may be reasons to at least be skeptical. First, unlike genuine scholars, Holocaust deniers are rarely motivated by a quest for the truth. Rather, their scholarship is often driven by racism, extremism, and virulent anti-Semitism. Holocaust deniers aim to persuade people of a conclusion that they hold, not in virtue of the facts, but due to ideological conviction. As a result, they do not hesitate to twist and falsify evidence when necessary. 
Their theories, moreover, often incorporate assumptions which interpret lack of evidence as further confirming their initial hypothesis. As a result, the theories of Holocaust deniers are often harder to refute than those of good faith scholarly dissidents, precisely because their intention is not to achieve the truth. So it cannot, therefore, simply be assumed, as Mill's argument from dogma does, that in a contest between truth and falsehood, truth must always win out. Instead of producing a more lively impression of the truth, engaging with the denialist literature might lead to our grasp on the truth becoming attenuated. As I said, I encourage you to discuss these questions in precept. I hope you have a good discussion. All right. Having considered Mill's arguments for freedom of opinion and expression in section two, let us move on to his defense of freedom of action in section three of On Liberty. Mill's defense of freedom starts from a view of what constitutes a good life for human beings. Mill is a so-called perfectionist or objective list theorist about human well-being. A good human life is one that exercises one's higher capacities, he thinks. A person's higher capacities include her deliberative capacities, in particular capacities to form, revise, assess, select, and implement her own plan of life. Mill's arguments for freedom of action parallel the structure of his arguments for freedom of expression. They are both instrumental and non-instrumental grounds for protecting freedom of action. Freedom of action is instrumentally valuable because it enables what he calls experiments of living, which are conducive towards the general progress of humanity. Mill thinks that oftentimes human progress comes about through the discoveries of eccentrics, oddballs, and free spirits who defy social conventions to live differently. If we deny them this freedom, the progress of humanity as a whole will be stymied. Freedom of action is also valuable for non-instrumental reasons, since the exercise of rational deliberation and informed choice of a plan of life is a central constituent of a good life for human beings. Let's look more closely at Mill's case against interfering with others' freedom on paternalistic grounds. Now, insofar as Mill insists that preventing harm to others is the only legitimate basis for restricting individual liberty, he seems committed to a blanket prohibition on paternalism. Mill makes two instrumental arguments against paternalism. First, the state power required for paternalistic policies is liable to abuse. Giving the power to officials of the state to restrict your own freedom, even for your own good, is a dangerous thing and liable to backfire. Second, because people are often more reliable judges of their own good than outsiders, even well-intentioned rulers will promote the good of the citizens less well than would the citizens themselves. However, these instrumental arguments may be thought to suffer from some of the same limitations as Mill's instrumental arguments for free expression. We might ask, what if paternalism actually works? So consider, for example, this news story. The headline, Motorcyclist Dies on Ride Protesting Helmet Law in New York, sounds like something from The Onion, but I assure you this is a genuine story from the Associated Press. Read the first paragraph. I'll give you a few seconds. Okay, and now pay special attention to the last line. So what do you think? Does a case like this raise a challenge to Mill's harm principle? Mandatory helmet laws for motorcyclists are paternalism in its purest form. The only possible justification for such laws is to protect motorcyclists from harming themselves. And yet, are such laws not clearly effective 
Don't they save lives? Is this really a case where the government is overstepping its legitimate authority? I propose that we take some of these questions up in next week's town hall. Now, in the face of such objections, Mill's perfectionist conception of happiness provides a more robust, non-instrumental rationale against paternalism. If a person's happiness depends on her exercise of her capacities to form and act on her own plan of life, well then, a principal ingredient of her own good must include opportunities for autonomous choice and self-determination. Therefore, interfering with a person's liberty undercuts the good of autonomous choice. Now, of course, if you read all the way to section 5 of On Liberty, you know that, like his defense of freedom of expression, Mill's opposition to paternalism is not exceptionless. He notes two types of exceptions in particular. The first concerns instances where a person is lacking certain crucial information. As Mill writes in section 5, if either a public officer or anyone else saw a person attempting to cross a bridge which had been ascertained to be unsafe, and there were no time to warn him of his danger, they might seize him and turn him back without any real infringement of his liberty. For liberty consists in doing what one desires, and he does not desire to fall into the river. The point of the harm principle, Mill is saying here, is to protect people's ability to pursue their informed desires. But in a situation where a person's desires are grossly uninformed because they lack crucial information, an interference in their liberty may be warranted. The second example concerns a case where a person herself attempts to sell herself into slavery or indentured servitude. Such contracts would be considered legally null and void, Mill notes, and rightly so. He argues as follows. The reason for not interfering, unless for the sake of others, with a person's voluntary acts is consideration for his liberty. But by selling himself for a slave, he abdicates his liberty. He forgoes any future use of it beyond that single act. He therefore defeats his own case, the very purpose which is the justification of allowing him to dispose of himself. All right, we've examined Mill's harm principle and the broad anti-paternalist position that it supports. We've considered some challenges to this anti-paternalism. Think of the mandatory helmet law case. But we've also pointed out that Mill's case against paternalism is not merely instrumental. The freedom to make autonomous life choices is one of the central constituents of well-being, according to Mill. So it isn't clear to Mill that the state or society would really be enabling someone to have a better life by taking away their freedom to make certain choices that strike us as ill-advised or foolish. I want to end today's lecture with another test case for the harm principle which, at the same time, provides a bridge to the topic of our next lecture on commercial surrogacy and commodification. Let us ask ourselves, are considerations of well-being, either harm to others or harm to the agent herself, really the only types of consideration that are relevant in deciding whether to legally prohibit certain practices? So to make this vivid, consider another news story, this time from the BBC. Please pause the video and take a moment to take in the content of this article. All right. So let us imagine, for the sake of argument, that everyone in this story is participating willingly, which is not the same thing as saying that they necessarily enjoy it. Now, this is obviously the case for the patrons, but imagine that the naked women, too, are receiving sufficient compensation to make their participation willing. All things considered, they'd rather have this job 
than be unemployed. So perhaps we can say that no one is being harmed by this practice, all things considered, if we're being extremely charitable. Still, doesn't the Chinese government perhaps have a point in banning it nonetheless? Is people's well-being all that matters here? You might wonder, what about the fact that this practice seems like an affront to women's dignity? It is objectifying in its most literal sense. And one can't shake the thought that the humiliation of the women whose bodies are being used as tables is part of the point of this practice, part of the reason why the patrons in these kinds of establishments get a kick out of it. Should a morally decent society permit its citizens to be treated this way, even with their own cooperation? Or are there perhaps reasons connected to human dignity or other values that would support outlawing such a practice, even if it doesn't harm anyone? These are some issues that we will consider in greater depth in our next lecture on Elizabeth Anderson's article, Is Women's Labor a Commodity? I look forward to seeing you next time.